There are three basic tools that are used for concurrent programming in Rust. These tools are thread channels and async array programming. Threads are mostly useful for computation that can be done in parallel. Channels can be used for concurrency and it can also be used to communicate between threads. And finally, we have async array programming. These are mostly used for IO bound computations, such as reading writing to a file or waiting for a network request to come back. In this video, let's take a look at threads. To spawn a thread, we'll need to import the thread module from the standard library. And then we need to call the function called spawn. Inside the function spawn, we put our code to be executed in the thread that is to be spawned. So inside here, we'll need to put in a closure, the code to be executed. For example, let's say we'll run a for loop for i equals to 0 to 5 we'll print the number. And then after printing a number, we'll make this thread sleep for some milliseconds. To do this, we'll need to call the function called sleep on the thread module, thread sleep. And then inside here, we'll need to pass in a duration, how many seconds or how many milliseconds that we're going to sleep this thread. To specify the duration, we also need to import another library. This is under std colon colon time duration. And then inside here, we'll specify the duration. For this example, let's sleep for 100 milliseconds after each iteration. Okay, so this is the code to be executed. Run the for loop five times, print the current number, and after each iteration, sleep for 100 milliseconds. Let's try executing this code. When we execute the code, you'll notice that the numbers are not being printed out. What's going on here is that the main function is executing, and it does actually spawn the thread. It spawns a thread to execute this code inside. However, after the main function finishes execution, this code is ignored. So that is why we're not seeing the result of the print statements being printed into the terminal. To see these numbers printed to the terminal, we will need to tell the main thread to wait for this thread to finish execution. And to do this, we will first need to capture what is being returned from the spawn function. The spawn function returns a handle. Let's call this h1. The handle is of the type join handle. It's a generic type. We'll come back to this later. Let's first import the join handle. Use std thread join handle. The join handle will allow us to wait for this thread to finish execution so that the main function will only finish execution after this thread is done executing. So going back to the join handle, it is returned by calling the function spawn. The type that is returned here is a generic type. Since inside the spawn function, we're not returning anything after this code is done executing, the return type will be a unit type join handle of unit type. And finally, to tell Rust to wait for this thread to finish execution, we only need to say h1.join. This will return a result. Let's simply unwrap the result. Execute the code again, and this time we see the numbers being printed out. And moreover, you will notice that the numbers were printed out slowly. What happened was it printed out 0, waited 100 milliseconds, and then it printed out 1, waited 100 milliseconds, printed 2, and then so on. On each iteration, it waited for 100 milliseconds. Now, going back to the example, let's see some concurrency in action. What we're going to do is spawn another thread. Let's call this h2. And inside the print statement, I'll also say h1 for the first handle and h2 for the second handle. We will need to wait for both threads. I'll move this at the bottom and then say h2 join unwrap. Execute the code again. And this time you see the result of two threads being printed out. In this example, h1 printed out the numbers, followed by h2 printing out the numbers. So you see h1 printing 0, followed by h2 printing 0. However, if you decrease this number of the time that it sleeps, then execute the code again. This time you see that sometimes it is h1 that is printing out the number first before h2, and other times it is h2 that prints out the number first. So this is a basic example of spawning multiple threads and waiting for all of the threads to complete execution. Next, let's take a look at an example of using the keyword move when we're spawning threads. For example, let's say that we have a vector. The type doesn't matter here, so I'll just use a vector of type u32. And then let's spawn a thread. Inside this thread, let's try printing the vector out. If we try to compile the code, the code will not compile. The compiler tells us to put a keyword move in front of this closure. So what we need to do here is put the keyword move. If you remember, the move keyword transfers ownership of some data into the closure. So the ownership of vector B will move inside this closure. But why do we need to do this? Why can't this closure simply borrow the vector B? Well, the reason is the main function may finish execution first before this thread executes this code. And let's see what happens. If the main function finishes execution first, this vector B will be dropped. 
And then let's say that this code is executed after. Well, by this time, this vector B is already dropped, so this will be an invalid reference to the vector. By forcing ownership to move inside this closure, the reference to vector B will not be invalid. So this is why oftentimes when you're spawning threads, you'll need to move ownership of the data into the closure. Let's execute this code. So we'll assign this to a handle called h and then call h.join.unwrap. Execute the code. And this time you see that the vector being printed out. And finally, let's look at an example of returning some data from a thread. So again, we'll start by spawning a thread. Thread colon colon spawn, create a closure. And inside this closure, let's return the number one. Return one of the type u32. So how do we get this value one being returned from the thread? Well, remember that the thread, when we call the function spawn, it returns a join handle. Let's assign this to h. We first need to wait for this thread to finish execution, so we call the function join. Up until now, we simply unwrap the result and then ignore the value that is inside the result. To get this value that is being returned from the thread, we actually need to pattern match. So let's say match h join. This will return a result. The result type has two possibilities. OK with some value inside. In this example, this value will be the one u32. Otherwise, it'll be an error. Since in this example, we know that there's no error, we'll simply ignore when it's an error. Execute the code again, and this time you can see that the value that is being returned is equal to 1. In summary, in this video, I showed you some examples of how to use threads in Rust.